Good morning, Church. Welcome to Calvary Life Assembly online service. We are so happy that you are able to join us together in this time of worship. So let's pray before we start. Thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that you have given us to come together, Lord Jesus, to worship your throne. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we worship you, Lord Jesus, help us, God, to be able to concentrate and to worship you with all of our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray us. Amen. So let's sing this song. It says that we are to call on Jesus' name. So in Romans, it says that uh, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So let's sing this song. Seruka Namanya. Kingdoms. 
back to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. True, true. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the grace, Lord Jesus, for your mercy, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Your name, Lord, is so high and above, and we exalt you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. For your name is so beautiful, Lord Jesus, beyond description.
so wonderful, Lord, and so powerful, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that nothing, God, can go against your name, Lord Jesus, that every stronghold in our life, Lord, will be broken, Lord Jesus, in our family, Lord Jesus, in marriages, Lord Jesus, in this nation even, Lord Jesus, all the strongholds, Lord Jesus, nothing can stand against your name, Lord, because your name is so powerful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just want to surrender the rest of the service into your loving hands. And God, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time of worship. We praise you, Jesus. In your mighty name, we pray now. Amen. Thank you, church, for joining us for this time of worship. Now we shall pass the time to pastor for the word of God. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. It's so good to be able to come to your home again and minister the word of God to you. I do have a word from the Lord for you. And before I preach the message, I want to thank your leaders for allowing me once again to minister to you and bring the word of God to you. My text is taken from John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39 this morning. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. It says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Let's pray. Father, this morning we pray that your word will strengthen our faith. Your word will change our heart. Your word will renew our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title for this morning message is called The River. The River. There was a town in Mississippi, America, called Rodney, R-O-D-N-E-Y, founded in 1828. Now, Rodney was a very prosperous town because it was located at the Mississippi River. And because of that, the land in Rodney were rich, fertile, and led to many cotton plantations being established and soon it attracted many rich businessmen and the town of Rodney began to grow and prosper and many mansions were built, many houses were built, many schools were built to cater for the growing population in Rodney. By the 1850s, Rodney became the busiest port on the Mississippi River between New Orleans, Louisiana, in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where my family right now are living, in the state of Missouri. And when a steamboat was created and became popular, Rodney became the chief port. And because of that, many investment, many money, and more money, more businesses, and more people began pouring in, and Rodney grew leaps and bound very quickly. Now, if you go to Wikipedia and search for Rodney, R-O-D-N-E-Y, it will read something like this. Rodney is a former city in Jefferson County in southwest Mississippi, approximately 32 miles, that means 51 km, northwest of Natchez. Rodney was founded in 1828 and in the 19th century, it was only three votes away from becoming the capital of the Mississippi Territory. And later he reads something like this. Its population declined to nearly zero after the Mississippi River changed course. If you look at Wikipedia, that's what they, they written there in the, in the Wikipedia concerning this town Rodney. It's concluded by saying, its population declined to nearly zero after the Mississippi River changed cost. What happened? What made the river change cost? 
Now, a large sandbar was formed over a long period of time in the nearby Mississippi River, causing the Grand Waterway to alter its course. Now, a sandbar consisted of all kinds of sand material that rose from the bed of a body of water and reached the surface because of the waves. And because the Mississippi River changed course, its river commerce was totally gone. And many businesses suffered, investment were no longer coming in, and many people left the town of Rodney. From a prominent town, Rodney right now, if you go to America, Rodney right now is a ghost town. All because the river changed course. You know, this incident remind me of a heavenly vision that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 47. In the vision, Ezekiel saw a river flowing out from the temple and where the river go, the Bible says it brings life, it brings healing. And there were many multitude of fish in the river and all kinds of trees that grows along the bank of the river, it bears fruit without fail. And its leaves will not dry up and dies, all because the tree were near the river. David said in Psalm chapter 1 that a tree that is planted by the river will bring forth its fruit in a season whose leaves shall not dry up. Church, the truth here is very simple and clear. If we want life, if we want fruits, if we want the anointing of God, in all that we are and in all that we do, we must stay close to the river. If not, things will dry up, things will die, and it will not bear fruits. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 7 that the Holy Spirit is like rivers of living water flowing out of us. Just like the river that Ezekiel saw, the Holy Spirit brings life. And today, we learn from the incident in the town of Rodney that river can change course. Interesting enough, so does the Holy Spirit. You see, one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is wind. And wind, you and I know, changes course. Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 8 that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. And because of this, the Bible exalted us in Galatians 5 verse 25 to walk in the Spirit or keep in step with the Spirit. Why? Because just like the river, the Holy Spirit is active and He is constantly moving. You see, the Holy Spirit is a moving spirit. The Holy Spirit is the flowing spirit. The Holy Spirit has His own plan. It has His own agenda. It has His own direction. And the Holy Spirit expects us to follow Him and not the other way around. When Jesus saw Peter and Andrew, he said what? Follow me. Paul said in Romans 8.14, this is what he says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Let me read that one more time. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Listen very carefully, church. The proof of sonship is this, being led by the Spirit. The proof of sonship is what? Is being led 
by the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Holy Spirit is a proof that you have a relationship with God. It is the proof that you have been talking to God. It is the proof that you have been listening to God. You have been obeying God. It is the proof that your heart is tender. It is the proof that you are willing to obey. It is the proof that you love God. The proof of sonship is being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the best advices I ever received came from a dear missionary friend of mine in Kenya. I remember many years ago when I started a church in Nairobi, this missionary friend of mine took me aside and said to me, Tony, can I give you an advice? And I said, sure. He took me aside and he said to me, Tony, don't work for God. Don't work for God, Tony. Work with God. Don't work for God. Work with God. What my friend said to me was actually truth and biblical. Jesus said in Matthew 11 verse 29, he says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, that you'll find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, friends, what my missionary friends said to me was true. We were never meant to do it alone. We were never meant to venture into it alone. We were never meant to decide upon it alone or plan on it alone. We are meant to yoke with Jesus in all that we do. We are never meant to do it alone. You see, when we yoke with Jesus, this is when it gets easy, it gets lighter, because Jesus will carry the heavy load and the burden that we are never meant to carry because He is stronger than us. Church, listen very carefully. We were never meant to carry burden that is heavier than what we can bear because we were instructed to cast our burden upon him according to first peter 5 verse 7. that's why it's never god's will that we serve until we end up in a hospital or in a mental institution just listen there's no glory in this at all do you know why god called us sheep because sheep was not created to carry burdens only ox or cows carry burdens, not sheep. You know, I've lived in Africa for 17 years. I have never seen a sheep carry burdens for the shepherd. I have never seen a sheep carry sacks of charcoal or woods on their back. I've seen ox did it, I've seen cow did it, but not a sheep. The sheep, what they do is they just follow the shepherd. They were not created to carry burden. And so are you. We are meant to cast our burden upon Jesus. Church, yoke with Christ and learn from Him. May I encourage you to yoke with Christ and learn from Him. Get advice from Him. Get instruction from Him. Get direction from Him. Learn from Christ. You know, some of our problems are so unnecessary because we don't learn from Him. Some financial crises are so unnecessary. Some church divisions are so unnecessary. Some conflicts are so unnecessary. Some family problems, some headache and heartache are so unnecessary. Many church problems are self-inflicted because, because we learn to depend on our own understanding. 
Many of our church problems are self-inflicted because we listen to our flesh. We reason with our mind. We want to do our own things. If we can avoid that, we can avoid a lot of unnecessary burden. No wonder God said to Israel in Jeremiah 2 verse 17 when they became slave and he said, Have you not brought this on yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Church, the Holy Spirit was moving and sometimes changes course, but we still stick to our own stubborn ways and we will pay the price for it. Listen very carefully, church. If something doesn't work, get rid of it. If a relationship doesn't work, get rid of it. If a plan doesn't work, get rid of it. If a ministry doesn't work, get rid of it. Listen to the Spirit. Follow Him. Make changes if you have to. Remember, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. It can change course. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 that our works will be revealed by fire, whether it's from the flesh or from the Spirit of God. Do you know why it will be tested and revealed by fire? Because God knows we are stubborn. God knows we are not perfect and we will miss it and we will do our own thing. Listen, church, it doesn't matter if it sounds or looks spiritual. If it's not from God, it will be destroyed by fire. So stay close to the river. Listen from Him and learn from Him. In Psalm 29, David wrote about the voice of God. One of my favorite chapters in Psalm 29. He says this, The voice of God is over the waters. The voice of God is powerful, full of majesty. Hallelujah. The voice of God can shake the wilderness, break the cedars, and make the deer give birth. In a nutshell, when God speaks, miracle happens. When God speaks, things are accomplished. When God speaks, things come to pass. When God speaks, nothing and no one can stop it or alter it. According to Isaiah 51 verse 11, God's word will not return to him void. It will accomplish what he pleased. It will prosper in the thing for which He sent it. Hallelujah. This is a good place to say amen. When God speaks something powerful and something good will happen. Church, we serve a God who talks and speaks. Genesis 3 verse 8 says, God's sound and God or God's voice was walking in the garden of Eden searching for Adam and Eve. God even named his son and called him the Word. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. God said today, not yesterday. Not two days ago, not two weeks ago. He said today. Why? Because God speaks to us every day. Jesus taught the disciples to pray this way. Give us our daily bread. In other words, speak to us every day. Give us your word every day. Hallelujah. You know, my wife and I, Christine, we are now in a season where we travel and preach to preach and teach and train young pastors and leaders in the Word. And we enjoy doing it and we miss doing this. It's been two years now since the pandemic 
and and we we hope that next year we can go back to the mission field and continue to preach and teach and train young pastors and leaders we are doing it because we know the purpose of God for our lives we know what we're supposed to do with our lives we know our role and our assignment and our responsibility in our life right now in this season of our lives because we heard the voice of God and there are times people will come to us and say Tony you know with your experience why don't you pastor a church why don't you be, be, be a board member in a Christian organization with your experience and know how why don't you you become an advisor for a mission department of a church Many people come to me and give me all this advice and I would say no politely. It's very tempting, but we say no because we know what God has said to us. We have heard His voice. Church, it's very easy to make the right decision and flow with God when you have heard from God, when you are close to the river. When Jesus was on earth, he was not pulled by the needs he saw. He was not pressured to do things because a need according to him, if you read the scripture, a need according to Jesus is not a call. A need is not always a call. Jesus was not stressed out. He was not pressured or induced to act or minister or perform just because there was a need there was a demand one time the crowd was following him and what did Jesus do he went to the mountain to pray a need is not necessary a call Jesus did not respond immediately when there's a need because he recognized a need is not always a call when he was told that Lazarus was dying, he did not respond to it immediately. He stayed three more days. He delayed his coming to Lazarus. In John chapter 5, he went to the pool of Bethesda and healed only one man. Although there was a great multitude of sick people, blind people, lame people, those who are paralyzed waiting to get healed and Jesus went in and healed only one. And I'm sure people were baffled, they were critical and confused by his action. I'm sure people talked behind his back and said, did Jesus only heal one person? How come uh, he don't care what? Uh, how come he doesn't care for the rest of us? And Jesus' explanation was very simple. He said in verse 19, I only do what I see my father does. Jesus knew his mission. He knew his assignment because he was led by God, not by needs. He only does what he sees his father does. In Acts 16, verse 6, Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in a Roman province of Asia, although there was an opportunity. There was an open door. There was a need. But they were led by the Holy Spirit to go to Troas instead. Can you imagine that there was an open door for us to preach the gospel? save soul and make disciples and the Holy Spirit said to us no you cannot go there <laughs> I'm sure all of you would say I'm sure I'm gonna say this if I if I heard no I would probably say this this is not the Holy Spirit this is from the devil but the Holy Spirit said no to Paul listen church a need is not necessary it's not always a call from God. If a need is a call from God, 
then I shouldn't be standing right here preaching the word to you. Why? Because in the hospital right now, there are many people who are struggling because of the pandemic. Some of them are hanging on to their life. Now that's a need. That's a need. I should be there. If a need is a call, we should be in those places right now, meeting the need. A need is not necessary, a call. You must be led by the river of God. The Holy Spirit needs are endless. If we meet all the need, we will be burned out. We will have no time for our family, no time for our health, no time for God. Because why? Because we are so busy meeting all the needs. Church, you must be led by the Holy Spirit. You must walk in the Holy Spirit. You must be guided by the Holy Spirit. A need is not necessary a call. Till the day I still remember the advice of my missionary friend who said to me, Tony, don't work for God. Work with God. And his advice had really shaped my, my life as a minister, as a missionary. I became more studious of God's Word. I became more prayerful, more patient in waiting for God to act in me and through me. I've learned today that before I step out of my house, I have to seek God first. I must hear from Him. I must know His will. I must keep myself close to the river. If I want to see fruits in my life, and if I want to see fruits in what I do, I have to stay close to the river. A few years ago, during a post-graduation party for my first daughter, Catherine, in America, I made a speech before my family, my missionary colleague, and friends. I could not finish the speech because I was crying so hard and I was so embarrassed. I couldn't finish it. I just cried till it just flowing out of my eyes. And I was so embarrassed. And nobody knew why I cried so hard in the middle of my speech except me. You see, when I was growing up as a teenager, I have nothing. I grew up in a poor family. And my family, my parents fought almost every day over money. I was very insecure. I struggled with low self-esteem. I stutter when I talk. I did badly in school. I have no dream. There were times I have entertained suicidal thought. And I was living with a deep sense of hopelessness. In a nutshell, I was a total mess. Total mess. When I couldn't further my studies in college, my father suggested that I work as an office boy in his friend's company. And I was very hurt by suggestion because that's how highly he thought of me. So one day I began to work so hard to prove my dad wrong that I can be more than just an office boy in an office. I can do more than just carrying coffee and tea to, to my boss or clean the toilet and remove the garbage. I can do more and I, and I proved to him by studying hard. And then I did so well in one of the colleges, I received an invitation to study in England but I couldn't go because my parents couldn't, couldn't afford it. They have no money to send me to England to further my studies. I was wanting to become a journalist. And I became very angry at God. 
when I couldn't go. I was so bitter, I was, I was so angry. I remember walking at night on a lonely road near my house. I remember looking up to the sky and I, I was actually yelling at God and said, God, why am I born into this family? I'm cursed. Why am I born in this poor family? This dysfunctional family. And I hated my father. I hated my mother for being poor. And I was a young believer. I just gotten saved. But things began to change when I disciplined myself to study the word and wait on God and hear from Him. And things began to change when I heard His voice and, and follow His will to go to Bible school and later on to Africa. It was extremely difficult, but it was my turning point. Friends, I learned something. When God wants you to make a hard decision for Him, it's always good. It's always good. Going to Bible school was a huge adjustment for me. And Africa was extremely hard, especially the first two years. But I knew God called me there. I was walking close to the river. I was following where the river was flowing. And it was hard going to Africa. But I did not realize there and then that God was planning, God was orchestrating for my future to give me a future and a hope. Just two years ago, I watched my second daughter, Victoria, getting married. When I watched the wedding, I noticed how happy she was. I turned around and I saw my first daughter, Catherine, who was earlier married to Adam. I saw her seated with Adam and her twins, twin kids, the twin daughters of theirs. So happy. And I look at my wife seated next to me and she was so happy. And my heart was overwhelmed with the goodness of God. That's why I cried during that post-graduation when I made a speech for my daughter. I cried because I was so overwhelmed with the goodness of God. The goodness of God totally overshadowed all the unpleasantness I went through when I was a teenager. I truly understood why Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh meaning for God and made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Church, I'm so glad I follow God. I'm so glad that I've listened to Him and obeyed Him. I'm so glad I stayed close to the river. Only the river of God brings life. Only the river of God brings fruits. Church, may I encourage you this morning, stay close to the river. The river of God will only lead you to life and to God's goodness. Follow after Him. Amen. I want you to close your eyes, and bow your head this morning. Just close your eyes and bow your head this morning. Ask yourself this question. What is the Holy Spirit trying to tell me this morning? What have I learned this morning from the Holy Spirit? If you are saying, Pastor Tony, pray for me this morning. I need to follow the river. I need to follow where God is going. My life seems like 
coming to a standstill. My Christian life is at a status quo. I, I want to grow. I want to move on. Pastor Tony, pray for me that I might follow close to the river. If you are that person, just raise your hand where you are. Just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for you soon. If you are the one who is saying, Pastor Tony, pray for me, I want to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Pray for me, Pastor Tony, that my spiritual ears, my spiritual ears are open to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Pray for me. If you are the one, can you, can you raise your hand? Just raise it to God. I can't see those hands, but God can. So raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the wonderful promises contained in this message this morning. I pray for your people that they will apply what they learned today. And for those whose hands are raised towards you, Lord, I pray that you honor their requests, their desire to follow after you, to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to pray for those who desire to hear from you. Open their spiritual ears and cause them to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I pray and hope that one day I will come, face, uh, come to your church and see you face to face. God bless you. Have a good weekend.